The examination system was the primary method used to select candidates for government office throughout most of the history of Imperial China. To obtain government office, a man, and it was always men, had to pass a series of difficult exams leading to the coveted Jinshu degree. Instituted during the Sui Dynasty in the early 7th century, it lasted until 1904 when it was finally abolished by the Qing Dynasty. Given its 1400-year history as a significant political institution, it exerted tremendous influence on Chinese culture, society, and education. The examination system was instituted by the Sui Emperor in 605 as a means of limiting the power and influence of the hereditary aristocracy, which had prevailed during the previous period of division, and to establish in its place an imperial autocracy. The influence of the aristocracy seriously constrained the power of the emperor to appoint officials. He needed a way to prevent the aristocracy from appointing themselves and their family members to positions of power. To achieve this revolution, he instituted an exam system and filled vacancies in office only with exam graduates. If a person could now gain government appointment by passing an exam, this would limit the power of the aristocracy and make the appointee beholden to the emperor rather than to the aristocracy. Accordingly, the new examination system deprived the hereditary aristocracy of the monopoly of power they had enjoyed during the period of division and shored up the autocratic power of the emperor. Of course, this was a long process rather than a single event. The overthrow of the traditional aristocracy would not be complete until at least the Song dynasty. During the Tang dynasty, the aristocracy continued to enjoy influence, but those who gained government appointment by patronage were increasingly derided. Therefore, even the aristocracy found it necessary to enter the examination system. And so, the number of exam passers continued to grow throughout the Tang dynasty. During the reign of Empress Wu, the examination system was greatly expanded, which opened government up to a much wider group. Those aristocratic families that were able to adapt to the exam system succeeded in maintaining their status. However, aristocratic families who thought exams beneath them became déclassé. The Tang Dynasty period witnessed the transition from aristocracy to meritocratic bureaucracy. Clearly a great advance for China's society. This was immeasurably significant, containing the progressive ideals of equal access, meritocracy, and rational government, when at the same time in Europe, feudal government was just forming. By the Song Dynasty, the civil service examination system was largely perfected. From then on, it remained the most prestigious path to government appointment. Possession of a degree became the signifier of status rather than pedigree. When this happened, the aristocracy vanished, and elite families found it necessary to produce a ginsher at least every few generations to maintain their status. Throughout its long history, of course there were changes and a few interruptions, but the basic structure of the exam system remained largely the same. Here is what an exam candidate faced at the height of the exam system during the Qing Dynasty. There were three preliminary exams and three main exams, each lasting several days. Preliminary examinations were the school entrance exams leading to the title of Sheng Yuan or Licentiate, which was required to take the civil service examination proper. School entrance exams were not originally intended to be part of the civil service examination system, but ever since the Ming Dynasty, entrance to the examination system was limited to men with student status. Theoretically, the exam was open to all. There were very few restrictions on who could take the test. 
One restriction was that for the past three generations, a candidate's family had not engaged in a base occupation, such as running a brothel. There were no class restrictions. A student was not asked whether he was a merchant, artisan, or peasant, nor did he receive any special privileges if his family had been gentry or officials. However, the expenses involved in reaching licentiate status were so great that from the start it was next to impossible for sons of the poor to enter school. Thus the wealthy maintained their monopoly on power. A young boy would begin study at about the age of six, memorizing characters. From there he would go on to memorizing short works and finally to the classics themselves. This was initially begun at home, but soon the boy would go to a village school. When the boy was ready, usually about 13 or 14, he would sit for the district exam. The district is somewhat equivalent to our counties. The exam would be conducted in the seat of district government, usually the largest city in the district. If the boy passed the exam, he could move up to the prefectural exam. Success in the prefectural exam gives you permission to take the qualifying exam. It was conducted by the Provincial Director of Studies in the Prefectural Capital. This was the final exam of the preliminary exams and granted the person the title of Shangyuan with permission to move on to take the civil service examinations. The first civil service examination was called the Provincial Exam. It was given once every three years and was conducted in the Provincial Capital in a permanent examination hall which was an aggregate of thousands of cells, large enough to hold just one man. Success in this exam grants the degree Juren, or Recommended Man, perhaps equivalent to the Master of Arts degree. Success in the provincial exam allows the candidate to move on to take the Metropolitan exam. This was given in the Beijing examination compound. Historically, the Metropolitan exam was the heart of the system leading to the Jinshu degree. Like all other exams, the Metropolitan exam was conducted in three consecutive sessions. Finally, the candidate would take the palace exam, conducted in the Hall of Preserving Harmony within the palace compound. This exam was conducted by the emperor himself, so answers had to be written in formal memorial style. This extra exam was added to avoid potential clicks formed by the grader and student relationship. The idea was that the students would be beholden to the emperor, not previous graders, thus establishing the master-disciple relationship between the emperor and his ministers. Following the palace exam, there would be a grand ceremony presenting the jinshur, or doctorate, degree, followed by many fancy banquets. The Ministry of Personnel would be on hand and give out government assignments immediately. The examination itself was daunting, to say the least. A typical exam might proceed as follows. At about 3 or 4 in the morning of the examination day, well before dawn, a cannon shot fired with a deafening roar. This would signal the candidates that it was time to rise and prepare themselves. About an hour later, there was a second shot, at which the candidates left their quarters to go to the examination hall, each one carrying in a basket everything needed for the examination, an inkstone, an ink stick, brushes, food, water, etc., everything they needed for a few days, cooped up in the examination cell, and they assembled before the gates of the examination hall. Soon, a third cannon shot sounded, and the gates were opened everyone surged into the hall. Each candidate looked for his cell, indicated by a numbered tally stick. Each cell was equipped with three long boards when stretched wall to wall. The highest became a shelf, the middle one functioned as a desk, and the lowest was a seat. No other facility, like a prison without bars. Here they spent three long days and two nights. Now the candidates were sitting alone at their desks. The hall became silent as a tomb, and instantly a gloomy atmosphere prevailed. When then the magistrate appeared, 
dressed in ceremonial dress. When the candidate heard his name called, he would come forward and bow to the magistrate. He would then be given a set of answer sheets and return to his seat. These answer sheets were in the form of a folded book of plain white paper with ruled lines printed in red. When the distribution of answer sheets was complete, the magistrate went to lock the entrance with a key and affixed a seal upon it. Resuming his seat, the magistrate announced the first question. It was written out on a large sheet of paper, pasted on a placard, and carried around the room so everyone could read it. The first question would be taken from the Chinese classics. Usually, it would be a partial quote taken from the classics. The candidate would then have to finish the quote and write an essay on the topic. Between 9 and 10, the rest of the examination was given out. This consisted of additional questions, always based on the classics, and at least one requiring the composition of a poem. On more advanced exams, the person would be required to spend up to two nights in their examination cell. After the exams were graded, the results were posted in the Great Hall. This was not the end, though. On the day after the announcement, a second examination was held. And a day after the results of the second exam were posted, a third, fourth, and even fifth exams took place. One exam always took several days to complete. In their attempt to make grading more fair and objective, writing was required to be done in a formalistic style known as the eight-legged essay. Students had to write their essays in the strict requirements of the style. Grueling as these exams were, chances of passing were increasingly remote. Job openings did not keep pace with the number of candidates. So, quota systems were enacted to prevent more candidates from, pra from passing than there were government jobs for them. Thus, the chances of a person making it all the way from the first exam to the Genture degree were roughly 1 in 3,000. The sight of a gray-haired old man taking the exams was increasingly common as people failed the exam again and again. Millions of Chinese men literally wasted their lives away preparing for an exam they could never pass. The great pressure put on individuals by their family clan, and even village, and the chances of passing becoming increasingly remote, drove many candidates to look for any advantage, including cheating. They would sneak in crib sheets, write answers on their underclothing, or bribe the examiners. All candidates were searched prior to entering the examination hall, and to prevent the examiners from recognizing the calligraphy of a student, all exams were rewritten by thousands of clerks and the names removed. Frustration in the exams drove many candidates to the brink of insanity or rebellion. Many of the ghost stories found in Chinese culture take place in the examination hall. Often they tell the story of a jilted lover who committed suicide, returning to exact vengeance during the exam. Other frustrated candidates might rise in rebellion against a system that arbitrarily prevented them from reaching their potential. The largest rebellion in Chinese history, the Taiping Rebellion, was led by a frustrated exam candidate who claimed he saw visions of the Christian God and Jesus who commanded him to wage war against the barbarians, in this case the Manchu elite. After the Taiping Rebellion, the Qing imperial government attempted substantial reform known as the self-strengthening movement. One of the reforms was a revision of the exam system. Instead of focusing on rote memorization of the classics, questions regarding practical statecraft were asked to recruit men more able to actually govern. However, there was a strong reactionary movement led by the Empress Dowager, and the reforms were overturned. It was not until the humiliating defeat by Westerners in the Boxer Rebellion in 1901 that real change was attempted. 
As part of a series of reforms, the exam system was finally abolished in 1904 after 1400 years of history. The significance of the civil service examination system to Chinese state and society cannot be overestimated. In addition to breaking the back of the aristocracy and creating an imperial meritocratic bureaucracy, as already indicated, the exam system contributed to an extremely stable society, civilian control of the military, and the dissemination of the Confucian worldview throughout traditional Chinese society. The Confucian tradition was institutionalized through the examination system. The civil service examination system was squarely based upon the Confucian classics and upon recognized commentaries on those classics. Thus, it provided basic support for ongoing study of the classics and provided curriculum for school systems. Given the influence the exam system had on the educational curriculum, all students, even those who did not take and pass the exams, were indoctrinated in the Confucian classics. Accordingly, they all shared the same values. This assurance of success in the examinations, dependent only on one's ability rather than one's social position, helped circulate the key ideas of Confucianism concerning proper behavior, rituals, relationships, etc., through all levels of Chinese society. Thus, there was a continuum between state and society. Further, with the introduction of the palace exam, the emperor enjoyed a master-disciple relationship with the scholar officials. This made the intelligentsia strong supporters of the state instead of its adversaries, like in other advanced societies. The civil service examination system was also an important vehicle of social mobility in imperial China. Even a youth from the poorest family could theoretically join the ranks of the educated elite by succeeding in the examination system. The hope of social mobility through success in this system was the motivation for going to school in the first place, whether one was the son of a scholar or a farmer. But even for the farmer's son, who did not do well enough to take the exams, even at the lowest level, going to school had the major payoff of a working literacy, and this literacy was acquired through mastery of the same basic texts that others who went on to pass the examinations at the highest level also studied. This curricular uniformity had a, an extremely powerful effect on Chinese society, and the major impetus for this uniformity was the meritocracy promoted by the civil service examination system. The exam system and the eventual rise of the Jinshu in government favored the civil over the military. Through the exam system, government favored literary studies and advanced civilians to important posts while keeping the military subordinate. Thus, throughout most of its history, the civilian government controlled the military. This hindered the government during times of war, but keeping military subservient was a good idea. Indeed, it is the foundation of good government. Military men serving in government, as military men, tend to emphasize the army's needs and become more militaristic. Of course, like any institutions, there were negative aspects as well. Many of these criticisms were known and voiced by the ancient Chinese themselves. The exam system created a stilted and scholastic method of scholarship. In other words, their writing was unnatural and tended to focus only on accepted dogmas with no outlet for creative and original thinking. The ancient philosophers decried the fact that students learned only to pass the exams, caring very little for real knowledge. The exclusive focus on the Confucian classics created a scholar official with no real knowledge of realpolitik. They could discuss Confucian dogma and write a pretty poem, but had very little ability to actually govern and administer a huge state like China. The exam system also caused too much stability. 
the Chinese political structures were very slow to change because all officials were indoctrinated into the same worldview when change was desperately needed such as in the modern era they were unable to make the change thus substantial modernization and industrialization came to China only after bloody revolution and civil war Though the Imperial Civil Service Examination System was abolished in 1904, China's examination hell continues. More than one and a half million people registered to take the entrance exam for China's civil service in 2013. Known as the Golden Rice Bowl, a government job provides good pay and stability. However, with only about 28,000 jobs available, no more than 1% of the job seekers will actually get the Golden Rice Bowl. Like their ancestors, the Chinese continue to aspire for government service with little hope of getting the job.